All right, now for a quick diversion with a little bit of fun stuff that you can do with some of the segmentation and interrupt information that you've just recently learned. So back in 2004, Joanna Rakowska posted an article called Red Pill, or How to Detect a VMM Using Almost One CPU Instruction. And what she was doing was she found a recognition that the SIDT instruction, which stores the interrupt descriptor table, could be used to profile what the location was of the IDT in memory. And what she had found was that in places virtualization systems like VMware or virtual PC, it had a particular reliable address inside of VMs that was not the same address that it would tend to have outside of VMs when run on a native host. And so, you know, the original red pill looked something like this, just a little bit of C code. Uh, just to translate this for you, this M was the place where she was going to store the IDTR. It was four bytes because a 32-bit uh, base address and a two-byte uh, limit. And then RPIL, this array, was basically encoding the assembly instruction for the SIDT. These zeros right here were going to be overwritten. So she takes the M, the key address of M, and overwrites it into the assembly instruction because the memory location is actually built into the SIDT instruction. So she writes that into the RPIL array. She invokes RPIL as if it's a function pointer, so effectively just calling this SIDT instruction. And then she checks the you know, output of it saying, you know, is the most significant byte D0? D then, you know, I think that I'm inside of a VM. So let's look at the slightly more verbose version of that, updated for 64-bit. So if you go into your VM for U verbose red pill, then you'll see that I have a 10-byte storage array instead, and that's going to store the SIDT, zero it out, and then just use the uh, compiler intrinsic for SIDT because Microsoft does actually provide a SIDT assembly instruction intrinsic, so I don't actually need to use raw assembly. And that's just going to store the SIDT or the IDT register into storage. And so then really all you do from there is you just check the most significant bit uh, byte and you say like, okay, well, I know that on you know my VMware system, it looks like it can be E2, E3, or E4. Now, by the time that you actually take this class, I will have gone off and profiled this on, you know, VMware Player and physical hardware, etc., because this all needs to be updated. But if I run it on my system right now, what I will see is when I get here and I've run the SIDT assembly instruction already, it looks like I have an E3. So if I continue on, then ta-da, my code magically knows that it's inside of VMware. But really, all it's doing is just, you know, checking that there's some fixed hard-coded signature that I choose to say, like, this is the most significant byte that, or the most significant portion of the uh, address value of the 64-bit base address. It's not actually the most significant, most significant part, because that'll always just be Fs. So the fundamental thing that makes red pill work is the fact that while ID LIDT loading up the IDT register is privileged, SIDT is not. And we've actually seen that multiple times now through this class. We saw GDT, we saw LDT, we saw TR, and we saw IDT. All of these system table registers, they all had a privileged component to write and a non-privileged component to read. So the implication of red pill back at the time, circa 2004, was that essentially, well, now malware can actually know that it's inside of a VM, and so maybe it's going to think, hey, I'm inside of a malware analyst sandbox, so I'm just going to not run. Well, you know, fast forward uh, 15 plus years, and, you know, virtualization-based security is a thing on desktops. And, um, you know, just in general, you know, you have cloud-based infrastructure and so forth. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily the case anymore that uh, malware is disincentivized to run in a virtualized environment. But still, it depends on, you know, who the attackers are targeting. Maybe they want to run, maybe they don't. So inside of the manual, there was this table that I had found at some point, and it said, you know, these instructions, are they useful to the application? And there's a whole bunch of no, none of these instructions are actually useful to people in ring three, and are they protected from the application? And the answer is no for a bunch of them. The reads are no's and the writes are yes. So, you know, I kind of found this to be ironic. But as I was updating these slides, I went to grab a new screenshot, higher quality screenshot, and this is what I saw in the manual instead. 
I saw that this thing like SIDT, which previously was unprotected, now says it's protected from the application if cr4.umip equals one. So what is umip? UMIP is user mode instruction prevention. So we go off and we look at CPUID, EAX7, ECX0, and we get an output in ECX of if bit two is set, that means that this hardware supports UMIP. Then furthermore, if the hardware supports UMIP, CR4 bit 11 has this user mode instruction prevention bit, which when set, means that the following instructions cannot be executed in CPL greater than zero, meaning anyone except kernel can't run SGDT, can't store the GDT, can't store the IDT, store the LDT, don't know what that is, it's actually just storing part of a control register, or store the task register. And so UMIP is a rather recent thing which has just been added on you know, later, more recent processors. So hasn't existed for most of history, exists now, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily used. So UMIP bit four, oh, sorry, bit one in CR4. And you know you can now go check inside of your VM, see whether or not UMIP is set inside of your VM. And go ahead and test it also on your physical machine because sometimes things like this might actually be supported by the hardware but not supported by the virtualization system. So maybe they clear it even if the operating system supports it. So I want you to pause now and go on and you know do this lab quick Go check bit 11 inside of your VM. It's okay, I'll wait for you. You should pause and do this right now because otherwise I'm going to spoil this in the next part. All right, and the spoiler is Windows doesn't actually use UMIP. So it turns out that they had a virtualization-based security mechanism that predated UMIP where they used it to block things like SGDT and SIDT. So they already had a mechanism. They're continuing to use that. Um, and so that's that's where their eggs are, and that's the basket their eggs are in. So then, uh, inspired by things like no, uh, Red Pill, there were subsequent things like No Pill or Scoopy NG. These would use other things like profiling the LDTR rather than the IDTR. And so you know this was done because you know Red Pill signatures could be unreliable, but this is less relevant these days given that Windows is not using the LDT. And Scoopy NG is basically just including a variety of different checks, including things such as uh, checking for special mechanisms that are virtualization software specific in order to detect whether or not software is running inside of a VM. This one in particular, VMware Port.io, we'll learn about a little more later in the class.